So uh, let's just formalize a little bit what we, we have seen for, for these elementary examples um, uh, into, into some definitions of passivity that, uh, that you find in the literature and that are, are, are useful in passivity-based control. So if we consider a generic system, again, just a black box with inputs and outputs, uh, and we denote E as uh, its energy, we are going to uh, assume that it is, it is uh, bounded. We are going to say that the, um, the system is passive if the energy balance equation looks like this. Okay, so available energy equals initial energy plus whatever I supplied into my circuit, into my, my system. We're going to say that uh, the system is output is strictly passive if the energy balance equation looks like this. So, not only I have the uh, initial energy uh, and the supplied energy, but some energy was dissipated and, and just you know went somewhere else. I, I don't know where, but uh, just into heat or whatever, what, as, as I explained before. So there is this component of dissipated energy with a minus sign. That means that I have some damping in my or friction, if you if you want, in my in my system, right? So we will call it. Output is strictly passive. So notice that we have a coefficient here that is positive, and we have the uh, the square of the output in this in this integral. That's what this is essential. And then we are going to call it input is strictly passive if uh, we have a similar balance equation, but instead of this, uh, what we had before with the output square here, we have the the actually the input. Okay. Actually, this this is the kind of system that uh, will be very useful in. in uh, later, it's the kind of system that you want to have when you are uh, doing uh, some control uh, because it means that you have dissipation in your, in your system and you are, you are able to, to, to stabilize it. Okay. Um, a, very a very important uh, statement actually, the fundamental theorem about, uh, uh, of, uh, of passivity is that when you take two systems that are passive, and you interconnect them in feedback, uh, like here. So this system is, let's say, is passive from this input to this output. And this one is passive from here to here. And you interconnect them in feedback. You will, again, recover a system that is passive from, from the new input, which would be the, the vector of these two guys, to a new output that would be the vector of these two guys. So, and, and you can keep co interconnecting blocks in feedback and you will conserve the passivity property. And, uh, and as we will see, this, this can be very useful to, to construct your, your, um, your controllers, always trying to maintain this, this passivity property, or rendering the system passive if it is not in the beginning. So uh, if the system sigma one and sigma two are passive, the interconnected system uh, is passive, uh, meaning the, the map from, from u to y is, is passive. So we, you, we write that as using this, this uh, funny arrow like this. That's in LaTeX, that's maps too. So that's the, the it's, we are seeing the system as a map, right? As an operator that maps, transform, once again, transforms inputs into outputs. Okay, so that's why we, we write it like that. Uh, so once again, the, uh, the electrical uh, circuit, let's see uh, what happens to this, this circuit. We already saw that if we have a resistive element, uh, we actually had this, this uh, integral of I square R, right, in, in uh, sitting there in the, with a minus sign. Uh, so meaning that uh, that's, that system is, uh, satisfies this, this balance equation, right? So my circuit, my RLC circuit, is output is strictly passive. So uh, what can I do with, with a system that is output is strictly passive? Well, I can, for instance, interconnect it with another uh, system that is passive. In this case, if I just use another resistive element, this resistive element, you can consider it as input is strictly passive because it's just a constant. So if you, if you put the, so the input here, I mean the output uh, on this side, 
will be, uh, of course, just RCI. Uh, uh, so you can uh, you can see that this is this is of course input is strictly passive, right? Because the the input and the output are basically the same, just the scale by by some constant. So it comes to connecting this over here, right? So I'm adding this this resistor into my circuit, and now I will have a new a new input. I will be measuring the 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 voltage from from here from these terminals. So this is what I'm doing in, 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 uh, in the, um, from the block diagram perspective, right? I have this output, I pass it through this new resistor, the, the, the current, and I inject everything back into, into my circuit, and now I have a new, a new input. So this is, this is how we deal with, uh, with uh, passivity, and we go constructing passivity blocks, right? So we start with some passivity block, we make an in a feedback interconnection with another passivity block, and we define a new passive map, from a new input to, to uh, probably a new output, in this case, the same output. All what we did here was adding a, to add a, a resistor. So what will happen with the uh, Kirchhoff's law uh, is that there will be this new term here appearing. So the, the voltage that this, uh, the, in, in the new resistor that I added. Um, and it will just go to the other side and will add up to, to RP. So what I did with this is, of course, we, I added more dissipation into my system. I already had some, but I added more with, uh, uh, so I used P for plant, right? There was already some dissipation there, but let's suppose that this is a control term. So I added, uh, I chose RC, and I, that's, that's like I'm modifying the, the, the circuit with this. So I'm adding dissipation into, into, into my system. That's what I, I have done with this, with this feedback here. Of, um, of RC, right? So now my new energy balance equation will look like this. And I will have that the available energy equals um, the initial energy, of course, so kinetic, uh, potential energy in the capacitor plus kinetic energy in the inductor um, that, are, that were already in the system. And um, I just added a resistor to increase the dissipation of the, in my circuit. I could probably also add a capacitor and modify the, 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 the potential energy, right? I could also modify that. Yeah, 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 you can, yeah, you, you can, if, if you, um, so if you connect a system that is, is uh, just, uh, you, you will definitely conserve the, the passivity property that you have, that you had initially, right? So with this feedback, you will uh, probably be adding more passivity or just conserving what you had. So if you have passive and you interconnect with passive, you will have passive, right? But if you, uh, if you add uh, some, um, so let's, okay, let's uh, see it this way. I imagine you don't have RP. So initially you don't have the dissipation. So uh, you don't have this term here. That, that system would only be passive, right? Uh, but then when you inject this, this dissipation, uh, you are adding, um, you are enforcing the passivity, and then you will have output strict passivity, right? This is the output. Yeah? So this energy equation is telling you that the system, after the interconnection, is output strictly passive. Yeah, so you can, you can enforce the passivity property with, with, the, with the field. So um, the, the energy of the circuit is the same with or without feedback. That's, that's the energy. Um, but by adding a purely resistive element, we, we just add the dissipation. We added friction. Imagine if it were a pendulum. Uh, previously, I showed you an example. Without friction, then you come and add friction. Now you have output strict passivity. Yeah? So you enforce the passivity. The addition of an inductance would change the kinetic energy. You could also go on and do that. And uh, you could also add a capacitor and modify the potential energy. So you can do a lot of things. You can modify, reshape the energy uh, the, way, the way you want, and then add dissipation the way you want. We will see how, we, by manipulating these uh, things, uh, you, can, you can control the system very nicely. The resulting system is still passive because, once again, the fundamental theorem of passivity tells me that the interconnection of, of passive systems is, is, uh, is passive, okay? 
So uh, what happens with if I, now I interconnect two systems that are different in nature, right? A mechanical and an electrical system. Let's let's well, actually the motor. This is supposed to be a motor. It's it's electromechanical. Well, let's let's just suppose that it's it's just an electrical system. Uh, so before we said that the input to the to the pendulum was was torque, right? But this torque is actually coming from somewhere, it, it, probably from from my hand or or or, or it, preferably from some actuator from from a motor. And this motor, so this motor has an output which which is going to be the torque that is going to be injected into the pendulum. But it obviously needs to have an input so that or transforms the energy to move the, the, the pendulum. And that input will be typically a voltage, right? You apply a voltage into the motor, you make it spin, uh, and, and uh, generate a torque that moves the pendulum, right? We, we all know that. If we look at the equations, we will have uh, the following. We have the pendulum equation with a torque that is, is being injected, and this torque is, is coming from the motor, right? So the motor sees this torque, so the, this, this term appears in both, in both equations, here with positive sign, here with negative sign, because in the equation of the motor, so this is the equation of the motor, this is supposed to be the, the um, uh, inertia, and this is the um, resistance in the, uh, the friction, sorry, in the, in the, in the rotor. Um, and this is the, the uh, generated uh, electro, what do you call it, magnetic feedback uh, torque or something is called uh, from the torque that the, the motor is generated, generating. And, um, and the motor sees the, the torque uh, tau L as, as a load, right? Because for the motor, it's, it's a load, the, 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 the pendulum uh, is a load. So you have this, this term uh, there and there. So th this is how these two systems get to be interconnected. If we go and, and look at the energy balance equations for, for, these, for these guys, so basically we integrate on both sides of both equations, we will have uh, an energy balance equation for the motor, which will be, of course, this, uh, uh, the, energy the energy available at some moment will be equal to the available energy at the beginning, whatever was dissipated in, in, because we have friction in the, in the rotor, and then the supplied energy, so basically the energy that is entering into the motor. Well, there is, of course, what I supply into the motor to make it spin, that comes, uh, that comes here, but there is the load. Yeah, okay, so, so I inject some, some energy to it, but some energy goes into moving the, the, the pendulum, so the supplied energy will look like this. And uh, for, the, uh, for the pendulum, the pendulum is all happy because it only sees energy coming in, so there is uh, supplied energy there, and uh, there is some uh, initial energy, uh, and, um, and there is then available energy. So basically, the available energy equals whatever is supplied through, I mean, coming from the motor, plus uh, the potential energy that was over there already. Now, the nice thing about this is that the whole thing, when I, the system interconnected, uh, will also have some energy, right? So, and this energy will be basically just the sum of, uh, of this plus that. So now we have the sum of the, the energy in the motor plus this energy in the, in the pendulum, that will be the energy of the whole thing. And what will happen is that if the pendulum didn't have friction, uh, it doesn't matter because this guy will, will uh, just contribute there and uh, the energy balance equation for the, for the closed loop system, for the interconnected system, will look like this. Now, we have um, this term of uh, energy dissipation and uh, we have um, this term of uh, um, supplied energy coming from all the way from, from uh, the, the input voltage that is, is here and now my output is, is, is still there. Okay, so now I have an interconnected system and uh, I have passivity. Actually, I will have output of strict passivity due, due to this um, from the map uh, V to, uh, to Q dot. And this is, so once again, this is because the motor is output is strictly passive with the input being the, this difference. Um, the pendulum is passive so I'm interconnecting a passive system with an output strictly passive system. So the resulting interconnection will be output strictly passive due to 
due to this guy, right? So I recover this, this term in the total energy balance equation. So again, the, the feedback interconnection of two passive systems yields a passive system. A passive system with input strict passive feedback yields an output strictly uh, passive feedback. Yeah, in, in, in interconnected, it will become output strictly passive. That's the, the case uh, that I showed you with the, well, the electrical circuit with the, just with the additional uh, resistor, right? In this case, the output is the output is Q, is Q dot, yeah. The output is Q dot. Yeah, there is no passivity with respect to Q. The output is Q dot. Velocity. And uh, yeah, one thing to remember is that passivity is conserved when you interconnect the systems in feedback. Okay, where is that feedback? Yeah, feedback. If you interconnect them in cascade, so the output of one goes in, as input into the other and, and so on, but there is no feedback loop, you, you don't have passivity necessarily, okay, from, from here to whatever output you choose there. We are talking about interconnections in, in feedback form. Uh, I will not do input-output uh, stability. Let's, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, uh, this, because I, the, I, I want to show you how we can use passivity for control. But for that, I first need to, to tell you about a couple of uh, things in, in uh, the steel of um, passivity theory. Um, so in linear systems, we have this, this concept uh, uh, of um, positive realness, which I believe was introduced by Popov, uh, um, a Romanian uh, mathematician, uh, who studied a lot uh, equations, uh, linear equations, right, and was figuring out properties of, of these linear equations. And one, one property that I think he, he, he actually came up with this, with this concept of positive realness uh, is, is the following. We, we say that a system, a transfer function uh, g of s for a linear system with, uh, with a, b, uh, c, and d matrices is said to be positive real if uh, the real part of the uh, transfer function is larger or, equal, uh, larger or equal than zero. The nice thing about this is that uh, a positive real system is, is passive. Okay? And there is another important concept in, uh, for linear systems, which is called a strict positive realness. So uh, a strict positive realness uh, is the property that uh, the, transfer, the real part of the transfer function uh, with S shifted a little bit, right? So epsilon is a small number, but, but positive. Um, that should be uh, larger or equal than zero. Okay, so basically you are asking, in this case, you are asking, in the first case, you are asking that uh, the, uh, the Nyquist plot is, is, is uh, somewhere here, right? So in, in all this uh, zone. And in the, uh, the other case, it has to be like, uh, in the, uh, sorry, the other, the other, in the other place, right? So the uh, positive real. In the first case, you are asking that the, the Nyquist be here, right? The, and in the other case, you are asking that the Nyquist be strictly separated from the, uh, from the vertical axis. And we call it strictly positive real. Now, strict positive realness is a very strong property of, of, uh, of, for, a linear, for a system to have. It basically means that the system is uh, strictly passive in the whole state. I, I didn't uh, speak about state strict passivity, but you can just uh, think of this as um, having uh, the, uh, in the energy balance equation, instead of having a Q dot, you will have here the, the whole state, right? So X, okay? So both, in a way, both input and output strictly passive. Now, the uh, nice thing about strictly positive real systems, uh, and we will see that with the Apollo functions, it will probably be clearer, is that we have this uh, very nice lemma that uh, is known as Kalman, Jakubovich, Popov, essentially because I think this, uh, the story goes that Popov uh, 
proved uh, the uh, one implication, Yakovovich pro uh, proved both, uh, Kalman proposed a different proof. Um, each of them works separately on this, on this result. Um, I think Kalman published it first, but uh, Yakovovich uh, apparently had it first, but then as many good uh, Russian mathematicians just put it in the drawer and uh, went to, to solve something else. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so it is called the KYP lemma. It's a very famous uh, lemma. And it says that um, a system is um, a strictly positive real if and only if, so a, system, a linear system like that, um, if and only if, um, yeah, there exists a matrix P, matrices L and W, such that all these uh, equations hold, all these equalities hold. So uh, in the case when there is no fit through, I mean, directly from the input to the output, which would be this, this term here, um, then these equations just boil down to these equations here. Okay, so we have that ATP plus PA equals minus Q, and, um, and this structural condition here. Now, th this one may be quite familiar to, to, to you because it, it just, you know that if A is Hurwitz for, for a system, you can, you can uh, always find for any, for any Q positive definite, you can find P also positive definite, so, such that you have this, this equation, it's called the Lyapunov equation, right? But here we have something else. We also have a relation between, so B is the, is, is the, the thing that is multiplying the inputs, and C is, is what defines the, out, defines the output, yeah? So, this condition uh, gives a structural property uh, between between the uh, a structural property of the system, and actually um, I this condition means that uh, that the relative degree of my system of G is is uh, one yeah, at most it, it it can be one. It will be zero if there is uh, this fit through, but if, if we are in this case down here, then it it can only be one. Uh, yeah, for this, uh, for this guy here. So this is a relative degree condition, and this is basically a condition that says that A should be, uh, should be Hurwitz, right? So it should be stable. Yeah, so that's, a, that's another thing to know. Passive system necessarily is of relative degree either one or zero. It cannot, a uh, system of higher relative degree than that cannot be passive. Uh, that's me back in the day with uh, Professor Yakubovich. I'm very proud of this, <laughs> of this visit, just after my PhD. And uh, this is the piece of paper that he used to uh, announce me as Professor Antonio Lori. I had just finished my PhD. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's sitting there. I, I will not do these slides now. I will do it in the, in the other set of slides, so I will just pass that. Yeah, one, one nice thing about passivity is that you can also use it, as, as I said, you can use it for linear or for nonlinear systems uh, because, again, it's a concept of input-output uh, systems, right? So um, for, for nonlinear systems, uh, yeah, let me go here. This is, this is like a nonlinear version of, uh, of the uh, KYP <coughs> lemma. Um, and um, basically it says, well, this, this, this statement, I took it from Halil, but the result is, is by uh, the original papers are, are, if you're interested, you should look at the Hill and Moylan. I think Hill was a student of Moylan, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm talking about a series of papers in 76 and 80, and there is probably one more um, in transactions. So he essentially introduced Passivity for non for nonlinear systems, and the uh, the uh, this these expressions, as you can see, they are really uh, like a nonlinear version of the previous ones. So you want to have a storage. Essentially, you want to have a storage function, or call it an energy function, such that the inner product of the partial of v with, with times f uh, is less or equal than zero, and you have this um, this inequality here. So Basically, the first one uh, is like having ATP plus PA equal to zero or less or equal than zero. And uh, this is, if we had an equality here, this would be the, the condition that we saw. Uh, I think it was, yeah, probably it was like this, right? 
And in this case, as you can see, we have a quadratic term here. So this is like having ATP plus PA equals minus, uh, uh, yeah, minus Y square, right? And uh, here we have again the, uh, basically the, the structural condition. You already saw this, okay. So yeah, this is this is the um, nonlinear version of of this of this thing here. Well, mostly of uh, what is below, right? Of this. And this formulation here is again is from Halil, but the original result goes way back to the 70s. As we will see, uh, we can use these to to also use passivity for nonlinear systems, not ju not just for linear systems. But it's nice because you can kind of in a way see linear systems as if they were uh, nonlinear as if they were linear because of these input output properties and think of in energy terms and so on. Uh, 